Over the past couple of years, I have bought a whole bunch of FPV stuff, and for the most part, it's generally pretty great, but there have also been some purchases that are downright terrible. So these are the five FPV purchases that I regret buying, starting with the least expensive and going to the most expensive. You may remember a few months ago, I built my first ever racing drone, and to stick with the racing tradition, I went with an analog setup for the drone. So, you know, it gives me the lowest possible latency. Naturally, however, along with that, I also needed an analog goggle setup. So I could actually fly, but instead of doing my true research, I ended up going down a route I now regret. Yep, these things that I'm holding, these are my converted, analog converted DJI Goggles V2 that in total cost me 670 bucks. However, because I actually only regret the conversion side of things, not the actual Goggles V2 themselves, the parts needed to convert it were around $190. Now, why do I regret that conversion, you may be thinking. Honestly, at first, I didn't. I thought it was the best thing ever because, you know, there was no need to go buy a new set of goggles, and quite frankly, I reckon they look pretty sick. What I didn't factor in, however, was the smaller things. The fact that every time you boot these goggles up, you gotta wait 10 seconds with the DJI logo loading in the middle of your screen. Then, you gotta go through the menu to AV in, and then finally, you gotta actually turn the adapter for the goggles on to start the analog module up. That is a good 20 to 30 seconds of time whenever you wanna boot up. Now, couple that with the need to attach and detach five of the six antennas every time you know you're setting up and also packing down because you don't want them to get damaged while you're traveling. Then add on the shocking battery life of maybe an hour, hour and a half if you leave this on constantly. Yep, that does mean that you need to turn the goggles off every time that they aren't in use, which then makes you have to perform the entire boot up sequence again. And yeah, we're talking a lot of wasted time there. To top it all off though, these are some hella bulky and heavy goggles that, you know, it's both a pain in the ass for traveling and also just wearing in general. They hang off your head and it just, they're, they're kind of frustrating in that way. It really just makes my original perk of not needing to buy another pair of goggles become severely outweighed by all of these little minor issues and I mean, hey, if I just ended up selling the V2s, I probably would have had enough money to go and buy myself a new pair of analog goggles or even HD Zero goggles, which are specific for what I want. Alrighty, next up is yet another DJI product. Look, I swear I'm not against DJI and I do actually use many of their products in my day-to-day -day job, but the DJI Remote 2 is simply just not one of them. Coming in at about $200, this was one of my most anticipated purchases, specifically bought for my first overseas trip with the Avada. At the start of this year, I ordered the Avada ProView combo with a separate Remote 2 on back order due to it being out of stock everywhere in New Zealand. It took about 60 days to finally come back into stock and get into my hand, which was pretty good timing considering I was due to leave for a trip to Bali in about a month's time. Unfortunately, however, it was not everything that I had hoped for, and instead of leaving me filled with joy, it actually left me drained of confidence. Now, after a few good weeks of practice, I could not shake the feeling of having way less confidence and control while flying with such a small controller. Now, I'm not sure if that's because I'm so used to flying with a full-size gimbal with the TX-16S, or if it's simply because the Avada that I was flying at the time just was underpowered or something, who knows? Whatever it was though, I just could not fall in love with using it. It doesn't fit in my hands that well, the gimbal throw feels very limited and the sticks do partially unscrew themselves when you're flying, which really is no fun at all. Because I bought it for its travel size specifically though, I did end up taking it with me and using it in Bali, which was seriously fantastic for what it was. Sadly though, since I've been back in New Zealand, I've actually really struggled to have the want or will to take the Avada out and fly it, and a lot of that comes down to the fact that I don't like this controller. Okay, so let's roll back time a couple of years back to June of 2021. This was another one of those purchases that I thought would be absolutely revolutionary at first, only to slowly continue disappointing me over time. What I'm talking about here cost me $450 and it's called the iFlight Bumblebee. This was my second ever FPV drone after my Tiny Hawk Freestyle 2, and so I was really excited to finally have a bigger FPV drone for the first time ever. Now, because I was quite a noob back when I purchased it, I didn't actually understand the concept of Cine Whoops versus open prop drones and thought they were all kind of just one of the same. If you are like I was then and you think the same thing, there are a few key differences between the two, some of which ultimately led to me selling the Bumblebee in favor of a new open prop FPV drone. Firstly though, is a seemingly obvious one and it's the fact that we have prop guards and prop ducts. Now, why is this an issue you may be wondering? Well, 
You see, the way a drone flies is super dependent on how the props deliver the power from the motors to propel and maneuver yourself through the air. When you introduce prop guards, but more importantly, prop ducts, you have to understand that this will make the drone have significantly more resistance while flying and will also make the drone a whole lot less stable, you know, when it gets stuck in its own prop wash. I had multiple instances where the drone literally fell out of the sky after I dropped the throttle and then applied the power again only for the props to not be able to create enough downward thrust to be able to keep the drone in the sky through its prop wash. Now this sort of thing would not actually be an issue if I'd planned on flying it the way that it was intended to be flown, which happens to be slower, cruisier, and kind of swooping vibes, or even indoors. I, however, I wanted to freestyle it and move it around like I had been with my Tiny Hawk, just, you know, with the added benefit of carrying a GoPro on board. Obviously, that's not quite the case. After a few months of owning it, I felt like I had really outgrown it and was kind of pushing the limits with every single flight just flying normally. So at the end of it all, I sold it and was just left disappointed by City Whoops in general, even though it was probably more of a me thing than it was a drone thing. Anyways, coming back to the present day again, it's time for me to shit on DJI for the third time in this video. I'm kidding. Well, kind of. But look, I seriously cannot stress enough here, please. I'm not doing this for the traditional culture of FPV pilots shitting on DJI. I am literally using their HD system in quite a few of my drones. I'm even using their damn mic right now. These are just my personal opinions based off of my personal experience with these particular products. No anti-DJI bias involved here, okay? Now, what is this fourth most expensive product that I regret buying? This may come as a little bit of a surprise to some as I have actually praised this purchase highly and will still continue to do so, but it's a DJI Avada. Coming in as a $620 regrettable purchase. As I mentioned earlier, I bought this drone along with the Remote 2 specifically to take overseas as a compact travel drone. And look, with all due respect, it has certainly served its purpose, allowed me to pack like super lightweight and also get some really epic FPV footage while I was overseas. But, and this is a big but, that is the only time that I've ever really felt like I was getting my money's worth with it. Every time since then, whenever I try to fly it in a situation where I could have been flying any of my other drones, I always find myself feeling like I'm missing out on those features from the other drones. The first reason comes straight back to the remote too, and that's the fact that it's actually the only remote that you're able to use with this drone. I honestly feel like I might love this drone simply if I were able to slap Crossfire into it and hook it up to a TX16S, but no, of course, DJI is taking the Apple ecosystem approach here and make it 100% impossible with their proprietary software and hardware limitations, meaning it's DJI's way or the highway. The second thing that really puts this drone in the Regrettables purchase box for me is the flight performance, or lack thereof. For the most part, this drone does fly really well and I do enjoy flying it, but my entire confidence in the drone itself depletes the moment that I make any form of a sharper yaw turn. The Avada is now well known for its yaw issue where, you know, a hard yaw turn will flip the drone upside down and propel it into the ground at pretty much full speed. I've actually had this happen plenty of times and to put some icing on the cake, we even had two flyaways now where the drone has flipped, hit the ground hard, and then just sort of bounced back up and continued to fly away into the sky at full throttle. My only saving grace both times though was the fact that when this drone was full throttling away, it actually depleted the battery faster, making it switch to low battery and then activating the return to home function. I swear that there was no other possible way to get the control back from the drone other than that automatic process. So with these two unforeseen issues that DJI still have not fixed, I have no confidence in flying this anywhere that there is some form of risk involved if you know the drone were to lose control, flip out, whatever. It sadly makes it a very unreliable drone in my books. It's also loud as hell, but I could probably forget that if it was problem free. Now, if you wanna see what gear I actually love using and the stuff that I carry in my FPV bag, you can check that video out here.